So I want to welcome everyone to the inaugural Walsh University President Thought Leadership Series. You know, November 17th has always been an important date in Catholic history. On November 17th in the year 270, we have the very first account of a Marian apparition by the well-loved Bishop of Pontus, which is a region along the southern banks of the Black Sea in what is now today present-day Turkey. Of course, today is the feast day of Saint Elizabeth of Hungary, a prodigy of charity herself, which is an important virtue in the lives of the Brothers of Christian Instruction who founded our university. And coming home, closer, home, closer to home, today is our birthday. Today we begin the 61st year at Walsh University. For it was on November 17th in 1960, seven brothers of Christian instruction traveled here from Maine to this very spot, what was an alfalfa field in Stark County, and opened the doors to what was then called Walsh College, and what we now enjoy, what those first 67 gentlemen who were students began for all of us. The brothers had very little in the way of resources but they had a tremendous amount of faith in what they were being called to do. On that very first day of class in 1960, Brother Thomas Farrell, Walsh University President Number 1, stood in the lobby of what is now Farrell Hall. That was the college. And he challenged our students who were here on that day being a part of history with these words. Together, let us work at the creation of a Christian house of intellect that will be blessed with the increase that only God can give. What did Brother Farrell mean in this clarion call to create a Christian house of intellect? Well, we don't know exactly, but he may well have meant that this was to be an institution that would seek truth, that would recognize truth, that would honor truth. And what is truth? Well, simply, what is? And how do we find truth? We search for it actively, honestly, and diligently. In that way, our intellectual life on this campus and in our community will be vibrant, it'll be invigorating, it'll be enriching, and perhaps even a bit uncomfortable as we reflect on ideas that will often challenge us. But Aristotle tells us that that is totally normal, for it is the mark of an educated mind that can actually entertain a thought without having to accept it. Inspired by those words of Brother Farrell, Tonight, together, we are seeking to further build this Christian house of intellect with the launching tonight of the President's Thought Leadership Series. This new series is all about the intellectual life, which is the hallmark of Catholic higher education. Since its inception in 1088 AD at the University of Bologna, the Catholic Church has always recognized the importance of education, and we will find education at the center of everything it is that we do. This search for truth in this 933-year tradition of the Catholic educational philosophy stretching all the way back to the invention of universities involves the active ingredients of faith and reason never in conflict, always leading us to some place beyond ourselves. And the more we are able to learn, the closer we will get to he who is truth. And so unlike all other creatures, our creator has gifted each one of us with these gifts of free will the ability to think and reason and make choices. 
In fact, if we are to learn and grow, we must never be settled in our opinions nor content with just the knowledge we currently have. We must freely seek out and actively engage in this process to learn and grow every single day. And that ability is what in part makes each one of us human. Thus, this Presidential Thought Leadership Series will engage us with renown, academic, business, and public service leaders, innovative visionaries from around the world, and serious-minded people who want to share what they know, what they thought about, what they've learned with all of Cav Nation, and challenge us to think about the current issues of our day, to consider and engage in new ideas and new approaches, and to grow in ways that make us more informed citizens, better people, and a more grateful and charitable community. It is, in fact, our hope and our prayer that these serious discussions, which are launched within the series, actually continue out across the campus and across the community, beyond the evening, in a variety of other venues here and across Northeast Ohio. I can share with you that what we seek to do is to help all of us learn and grow. That is the mission of Walsh University, and this initiative is tied directly to furthering that mission. So with that as a background, as a frame up to what this is all about, I would like to ask Father Sabula to begin us in our journey of learning tonight with prayer. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Let us begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us recall God's presence and invoke his blessings and graces upon us. Loving God and Father, we have gathered this evening for this special presentation on your great gifts of human sexuality and intimacy, combined with faith and reason in the tradition of St. Dominic. We thank you for the presence of Father Nicanor, who comes to us from Providence College. Lord God, we pray that this event tonight would help us all embrace the truth of our sexuality and intimacy according to your creative design for men and women, for the family, for the flourishing of human relationships and the good of society. Lord God, help us to listen more before we speak. Let our discourse be civil and respectful of others. Lord, enlighten our minds and direct them to right judgment on what is truly basic and good for human flourishing. We pray all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lady of Perpetual Help. So tonight we have the opportunity for each one of us to consider what each of us understands to be how our Creator intended for us to use our own gifts in our daily life. This is an essential question for Walsh University, as our mission is to prepare our students for life, for their life's purpose, in addition to career preparation. Tonight, there is perhaps no one else on the planet more qualified, more prepared, more learned, more willing to share with us his thoughts on this urgently important topic than this simple, 
humble friar who is our speaker for tonight. Truly, this is the lecture of a lifetime for all of us. Our speaker tonight is a world-renowned theologian and biologist. Father Nicanor is a priest in the Order of the Preachers and was ordained in 2004. He earned his bachelor's degree in bioengineering from the University of Pennsylvania, summa cum laude, and he went on to earn a PhD in biology from MIT, a Master of Divinity and the Licentiate in Sacred Theology from the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. He also holds a Master's in Business Administration from Providence College and a Doctorate in Sacred Theology from the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. He's a fellow of the International Human Frontier Science Program at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research at the University College in London. He has conducted research, published books, papers, and presented at conferences, and won many, many awards. Father Nicanor is a founding member, a board member of the Society of Catholic Scientists, and has served as a consultant and committee member on topics such as bioethics and faith for the senior most people in government in the Philippines and in the United States, as well as a variety of other groups around the world, including the US Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Vatican. At Providence College, he holds dual appointments as a professor of biology and a professor of theology, teaching and conducting research in his areas of expertise, including cancer, aging, healthcare ethics, and bioethics in the Catholic tradition. He also holds an appointment at the Dominican University in the Philippines. He has intellectual interests in both molecular and cellular genetics, as well as moral theology. To be honest, he has achieved so much, I could stand here for a long time and talk about how he is pursuing his interests actively and with great success. But we're here to hear Father talk. So before I begin, I would just like to offer the format for tonight will be an opportunity to listen to Father and to reflect on his talk for all of us, and then we'll be followed up by a question and answer period. An extraordinarily accomplished priest scientist, I am privileged and humbled to introduce to each of you the inaugural speaker for the President Thought Leadership Series at Walsh University. Please join me in giving Father Nicanor a rousing Cav Nation welcome. So thank you very much, Tim, for that kind introduction. I'm a Dominican. I'm a geek for God. That's what we do. There's four of us here. That's why we have letters after our names. But today, this evening, I'm not here as a molecular biologist. I'm not here as a moral theologian. I'm here as a priest who has accompanied hundreds, if not thousands, of undergraduates at Providence College for the past 15 years. The first 10 years, I lived in the sophomore male dormitory. And uh, it was a great privilege, privilege of mine to simply be present to them. Uh, they would come in the middle of the night and knock on my door, and I'd have to put my habit on, and we'd go out for a walk. And it'd usually be, Father, she dumped me. That, would be, that, that was like a very common theme. Uh, the other one was, so-and-so died. And the third was, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And so many of the conversations that I've been privileged to have with the students who have welcomed me into their lives, often many of their conversations, especially when you're 18 and 19, 20, 21, has to do with sex, intimacy, relationships, friendships, and the like. A few years ago, an alum of Providence College called me up because he wanted to talk to me. And he wanted to talk to me because that past weekend he had attended a little reunion of Providence College alums in Boston. A lot of our students end up going to Boston. And he said he walked into that apartment 
where a couple of his, well, a bunch of his classmates were there. And he looked around and he realized that he had hooked up with every single woman in that room. But the question he wanted to ask me was this. He said, Father, how now can I fall in love? And in many ways, my thoughts this evening is an updated version of that conversation I had with that alum. What I hope to do today is to just give you a landscape view of two cultures, two cultures on a Catholic campus, two cultures in our society that are competing with each other with vastly different accounts of what it means to be human and very different accounts of what sex and intimacy are in, um, involved. So these are the questions that we're going to be dealing with today, sex and intimacy. And many of my students are convinced that they know the answers to these questions, but they still hurt, they still get wounded. And so what I would like to do today is to have a conversation about the ongoing challenges. And please, uh, you know, part of what we see on colleges, college campuses around the country, if not around the world, is that there is a struggle over what these two words mean. Because how you understand these words are going to guide the way you live, you love, you cry, you laugh. And so that's why this is so important. It's so important precisely because it gets to the very heart of what it means to be a human being. And what I'm going to propose today, like I proposed to uh, my alum some years ago, is that one of the reasons why he faces this tension in his life, one of the reasons why he struggles, is because there, he is living in two cultures. And it was no accident that he came to talk to a priest, because he, had, he wanted to know what the Christian gospel had to say about love. Because he had experienced, after many years at Providence College, a Catholic school, and post-campus life as a young professional in Boston, he had lived a particular culture. He had lived in a particular world. And he wanted to know if there was something else, precisely because his heart was seeking something else. And so these are the two cultures that we are going to be examining today. The first is hookup culture, and we're going to uh, really penetrate that culture. I uh, have started in my Christian moral, a growth in Christian moral life, growth in Christian life, which is a uh, theology 270 at Providence College. We have a three week conversation about hookup culture. And so I'm going to share the fruits of that conversation over the past few years, as well as the readings that we've had in order to really get to the heart of what the hookup culture is. Because make no mistake, the hookup culture is here. It's here at Walsh, it's here everywhere. It penetrates all of who we are. And so we want to understand what's going on around us. We have to understand this culture. And then I'm going to propose the Catholic alternative. It's an alternative. And I'm going to present that alternative in the way that I find most powerful using the theology of the body of Pope John Paul the Great. And so you basically get to choose. And that's what I tell my students. You get to choose. There are, there are two paths, and you get to choose which one you will walk. And which one you will walk will determine the joys and the sadness of your life in so many different ways. So how does each culture understand sex and intimacy? This is really the focus of my comments this evening. I'm only going to be speaking for about half an hour, because what I think is most important is we have an ongoing question and answer. We have a conversation about these two cultures and the opposing tensions that they often embody. So let's begin with the hookup culture. And I'm going to rely primarily here on this incredibly insightful book. So this is the book, American Hookup, by Lisa Wade. She's a sociologist. And uh, this book is based on 24,000 students' surveys from the Online College Social Life Survey. 
And she also, in the course of her research for this book, um, invited 100 plus students to contribute regular journal entries on the way they interacted with each other and how they understood sex and intimacy in the communities in which they live. And then she examined, she just basically Googled, I bet, first-hand accounts of sex on campus from media student newspapers. This, she went to the sources. Now, my students have been reading this book with me for several years now in my uh, theology class. And they can tell me, they tell me, they confirm that it rings true. And so this is the source that we're going to rely on to try to penetrate, interrogate, and understand the hookup culture that permeates so much of our young people's lives. And, and, and let me be honest, I am addressing primarily here the undergraduates in the audience. Because hopefully those of us who are old fogies, we've made a decision. We've already walked that path. But for those who are young at heart, and maybe that is all of us, we have to choose again and choose again which path we are going to walk. So first of all, we'll begin with what is a hookup and how do you define the hookup culture? And I don't know if I should ask this of the undergrads here, you know, what's the hookup culture like here at Walsh? I've done it in my own classroom, so I've asked my own students, and um, they've been very honest, and I've learned a lot. And of course, living in a dormitory, you see the hookup culture, <laughs> especially on Thursday night at 3 o'clock in the morning. So it's casual sex. So what defines a hookup is casual sex. And it's really understood to be sex without intimacy. And this is what we'd like to explore. What does it mean to say that there is sex without intimacy? And how does it affect our young people, and not our young people? How does it affect the human person who is embedded in this particular culture? Now, this is a quote that I've ta taken from the book. That's the hookup, a drunken sexual encounter with ambiguous content that is supposed to mean nothing and happen just once. So this is, I find this to be, my students say this is the best definition. We have, to, we have to figure out what this all means. Who's involved in the hookup culture? What does a hookup entail? I've learned so much from my students, and not just from my students in my, in my classroom, but the students that I've accompanied over the last 15 years. I've been a professor at Providence College. So what is a hookup based on uh, the data that uh, she presents? 40% of, of hookups are defined as sexual intercourse, 13% oral sex, 12% nudity and genital stimulation, and 35% open mouth kissing and groping. So basically, it's all of the above. And what's interesting is that when, I, when a student comes to me to talk about hookups, I have to say, what do you mean? Because it varies from student to student. And I am sure that if I asked and polled the students here how they understood hookups, you would get something like this, a smorgasbord of sexual activity to greater or lesser degrees. As one student pointed out, it's about the different bases, Father, and how far you run them. So this is a hookup. And depending upon who you are, this may be, or more or less, be what you define yourself to be. Now. She goes through, she spends a couple of chapters basically doing a phenomenology of hookups. And she's asking, what, who gets involved in this hookup culture? And she divides them into four different groups. For the undergrads, you'll find yourself in at least one of them. And one of the things that she pointed out is that undergraduates move from one to the other. So the enthusiasts are those who are gung-ho. This is life, this is fun, this is joy. And so they, hookups are, an, are a part of their well-being. It is often scheduled. This night is hookup night. Now, I'm not quite sure who I'm going to hook up with, but 
tonight I'm going for a hookup. And one of the things that this book has is it has amazing first person accounts of enthusiasts. They, it's their hobby. It's like playing ping pong. It's like brushing your teeth. It's just something you do. And it's kind of fun. That's the enthusiast. Utilitarians, and when unfortunately she doesn't give you numbers, I'm a molecular biologist, I would have loved to know what percentage of undergrads fall under each category. But unfortunately, she didn't provide that. Utilitarians, they want a long-term relationship, but they don't know el how else to get there, so they're gonna hook up with the fingers crossed in the hopes that something is gonna come out of this. They're the utilitarians. And one of the things you get over and over again in these first-hand accounts, they're very disappointed. They're disappointed because the culture itself is not ordered towards long-term relationships. So you're trying to get something in a culture that basically resists exactly what you're trying to achieve. Then there are dabblers. Freshmen fall under this category. Not sure yet. Possibly, one night here, one night there, not quite sure what to do. I'm dabbling. And this, and in these accounts, you often have religious students, Muslims, Catholics, evangelicals. One part of them says no, the other one says ooh. And that tension defines that dabbling. And then there are the abstainers. And there are many reasons why young people abstain from the hookup culture. There are religious ones, of course. But there are those who just simply go, this is too messy for me. And I'm looking for something else. And I'm just going to wait. And then there are a whole bunch of STEM majors. They have no time. <laughs> I know a bunch of those. <laughs> they simply have no time. My students will say, Father, or go? No way. <laughs> so you've got these four categories, and depending upon where you fall, your experience of the hookup culture is going to vary, and its impact on you, again, it can be to lesser or greater degrees. Now, she, uh, Nick, uh, Lisa Wade has an interesting historical chapter. She wants to trace the origins of the hookup culture in the United States. And she, she identifies two particular foundations for the hookup culture. These are her words, not mine. So she identifies the hookup culture with the women's liberation movement uh, decades ago. And this is how she phrases it. Most girls in America today grow up being told that they can do anything, and they know, when, they know when this is emphasized that what it really means is that they can do anything boys do. And one of the things that Dr. Wade traces over the development of the hookup culture is how our dating practices in the United States over the last several generations have moved from women-centered dating practices to men-centered practices. The hookup culture, according to her and according to all of the students that she's talked to, emphasizes the male. The male is in charge. And then she also, again, in another chapter, talks about the gay liberation movement. And this is a sentence that simply captured me. Sex removed shame. And the hookup culture, in her analysis, is a meeting of both of these. It was a movement to liberate sexual desire with an attempt to change gender roles. Now, for better or worse, you can agree or disagree with her. But I think it's an interesting insight and analysis. 
Now, how do you hook up? Now this I had to learn. I had to learn this from my students and we've gone through this and they filled in the blanks. So, step one, pre-game. Father, you got a pre-game. It starts about three o'clock in the afternoon because you have to be drunk by the time you get to where you got to go. And it's cheap. So we're going to get the cheap beer. We're going to pre-game, get really drunk so that I'm ready to go. <laughs> and I have been told over and over again that alcohol is the premier social lubricant. Without alcohol, you could not have the hookup culture. Second, grind. I've had students demonstrate this to me in class. We don't have to do the demo here. But there are moves that the, but you have to do when you're at these parties, grinding, initiating, and then you have to do something. And that a something depends upon who you are and what your particular tastes are for that night. But I would like to focus on step five and step six. So step five especially, step five, we have, my students and I spend hours discussing step five. Because in many ways they will say step five, step five is what defines the hookup culture. These are her words, establish meaninglessness. You either have to be incredibly plastered, so the sex was not you, that was the alcohol, or you have to cap your hookup. You have to figure out exactly how you're going to end it. And this is what my students say is most difficult. You have to create the emotional distance between what you have just done and what you want to feel. Now, step six is something I add because of things she points out. And my students uh, are very keen to talk about this. The morning after, there's the debrief. We're going to compare. Was your hookup better than mine? And my, pro <laughs> my students at PC says, Father, the athletes are number one. And they've actually ranked the different sports. So if you've got an athlete from this sport, that's a higher hookup than the one. And, the <laughs> and just the other week, one of my, <laughs> my class agreed lacrosse way at the bottom. <laughs> now, I don't know if Walsh has lacrosse. We have lacrosse. Ah, the lacrosse. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about how you guys rank. But according to the Province College women in my classroom two weeks ago, lacrosse one of them said, I didn't even know we had a lacrosse team. <laughs> and we have a very good lacrosse team. So this is the hookup culture for you. This is the steps. Now, these are some of the quotes. I just wanted to highlight the quotes, because I think the, highlight, the quotes are so good. Once the sex is over, the rule is to go from hot to cold. The power of cool is in needing no one. And my students are like, yeah. If you are needy in any way, you've lost. You've lost the hookup game. It's a contest to see who cares less, and guys win a lot at caring less. A college student, a direct quote from the book. Here's another one. I've only spent about 10 minutes alone with him in which we joked and made casual small talk graciously avoiding the fact that we've had each other's genitals in our mouths. There are quote after quote after quote where what you see, another college student, it's mostly me psyching myself out, telling myself that now we've hooked up, our friendship has to change. It doesn't, or at least I really don't want it to. But I can't help feeling so weird every time I see him since then. All I can think is, it didn't mean anything to me, but did it to you? Do you hate me now because you cared and I didn't? 
And you have sentiments like this, page after page after page in this, for me, an incredibly eye-opening and insightful book on the current state of our undergraduate population. So what is sex in the hookup culture? And I've kind of just taken a couple of statements from all over the book. First, it's fun. The word that is used over and over again, it's fun. Sex is hot. You certainly don't want to be cold until after the fact. But sex itself, that's hot. And you want to get with the hot people. And you want to be hot. It is emotionless and meaningless. It is drunk. And this is something I did not really appreciate until I had a very honest conversation with my students. I didn't realize that there's a difference between drunken sex and sober sex. So a student told me the other day, sober sex is dating. Drunken sex, that's a different category. Sex is physical. Sex is temporary. It has no long-term uh, consequences. This is so fascinating to me. My students will say, Father, you brush your teeth, you're done, you go on. You have sex, it's like playing ping pong, Father. And what is most tragic, sex is dangerous. And I have women in my classroom tell me how in order for them to go from one place to the other, they have to go in packs, even going to the bathroom. I didn't realize, and the guys in my classroom did not realize, that there's a code amongst women. When I get up to go to the bathroom, someone else has to feel that she wants to pee as well. And when, when, the, when the women told the guys that, the guys were like, huh? You guys pee together? <laughs> and no, they explained to the men in the room that that was part of the culture. That's how they stayed safe. That they could not go to the bathroom by themselves, the restroom was an unsafe space. And being a woman was so unsafe. It broke my heart. Now, how does it affect people? And again, we're just going to look at some of these first person accounts. Now, this is Nicholas, uh, this is uh, Lisa Wade. All of this. The ban on warmth, the imperative to be cool, and the permission to be cold is really hard on students. Suppressing their instinct to be kind and the sense of entitlement to the same was jarring and exhausting. One of my students called it emotionally shredding. And Dr. Wade actually proposes that one of the reasons why we have such a significant increase in mental health concerns amongst our young people is because the hookup culture is so difficult to navigate emotionally. It's so difficult to navigate personally on a day-to-day -day basis. One in three students say that their intimate relationship, this is all her studies, have been traumatic or very difficult to handle. In addition, and this is again so typical of what my students report to me, there's a persistent malaise a deep, indefinable disappointment. Students find their sexual experiences are distressing or boring. This is self-report. This is what thousands of students are saying in private. They would never say it to each other. But they're saying this to people who dare to listen, to people who dare to ask. A college student, what I really want right now it's for someone to be nice to me and just want me in that way. When I hear that, that breaks my heart. Because we all want that. And it appears from all this data and from the self-reports that I get from my students from, from this book, this is the farthest thing from the hookup culture. This is definitely not the goal. Another college student, I can't handle another negative sexual relationship in my life my heart might break. And one of the privileges of being a professor, is especially a priest professor, is my students come to me in the hopes that I can help them pick up the pieces from all over the ground. And so we try to put them together in Christ, with his grace, with his power, with his love, with his mercy. It takes time. 
It takes time, especially the longer they've been in the hookup culture. It's like detox. It's really, really hard for them to extricate that because all of their friendships, all of their social media contacts are part of this culture. And so they don't know what to do. Now, what I like to do is to present another perspective, the Catholic perspective. This is the Catholic culture. And I'm going to use the theology of the body. And the theology of the body uh, was written by um, John Paul the Great. And it's a theological reflection on the experience of human sexuality and love that was based on the Pope's experience when he was a young priest. For, for a bunch of years, he was a chaplain to college students in Krakow. And he accompanied them. And he reflected on them using particularly Genesis, the book of Genesis, to try to understand why we are the way we are. And that's what I would like to propose to you. I want you to see, is this make sense of your experience? Does it make sense of how you love? Does it make sense of how you cry? Does it make sense of how you want so much more than the culture provides? This is a counter proposal to the hookups that predominate our undergraduate, I would say, our culture. So this is from the book of Genesis, and I'm going to focus on two particular quotes that the, fo that the Pope you know, focuses on, zooms in on, and he says, what does this mean? The first is this. It is not good for the man to be alone. This is from the second chapter of the book of Genesis, the 18th verse. And he's a philosopher, but he's going to reflect on this, and this is what he says. Each of us is incomplete. And this is a foundational claim about the human heart. There is a hole in your heart. And it will be there. So now here's the way the, the Christian gospel will say, it will be there forever. You are incomplete. There is something missing in you. And at some point in your life, you discover that incompleteness and each of us deeply desires another to become complete. So what you do is you discover in yourself first subconsciously and, and often consciously that there's a hole in your there's something missing. And you start looking. And you start looking first for stuff, but the stuff doesn't usually satisfy. So you start looking for another, another person. And so the Pope will talk about the communion of persons, the conversations between two human beings, two hearts, each of it incomplete. And he will define this as the sexual urge. He will say the desire for another to complete us defines the sexual urge. This is how you understand sexuality. It is the desire for another to fill what is missing in us. Now, he then goes to another line in Genesis. The man and his wife were both naked, yet they felt no shame. There's this one line. And then a few lines later, you have this. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. And he contrasts those two. And he says this. Each of us is vulnerable. Each of us struggles with shame. Now, I want you to see that this is a proposable proposal of what it means to be fundamentally human. That at the very heart of our being, there's something missing. But at the same time, we're incredibly fragile. We're incredibly vulnerable. We struggle with shame. We struggle with insecurities. We struggle with body image issues. There are many things we struggle with. We're not quite sure, and this is what I tell my students, we're not quite sure if another can love us. 
And then we're not sure if we can love another. And this profound uncertainty, you know, in a sense, you're going to have two things, right? A tension, an incompleteness. I want another, but our shame. But I'm not sure if another will want me. And this is the tension of our lives. This is the tension that defines our deepest yearnings. This is the Christian proposal. So what happens? Well, and the Pope says something which I think all of us deeply understand. There's only one thing that can heal shame, and it is not sex. It is love. Because it is healed only when someone can look at you in your nakedness, in your ugliness, in your imperfections, with all the stuff that is bulging and out of place, and still say, you're beautiful. I love you. This is the tension. And so when we go out into the world looking for completeness, looking for love, Shame is our enemy. Shame, we struggle with that. So then the Pope will say, how do you seek completeness in spite of, despite your shame? And this is where he proposes what is called the law of self-gift. He says this, we complete ourselves when we give ourselves away. This is the law of self-gift. And I'm going to have, again, there's some, so much written on this. I just want to propose this as a beginning of our conversation. Self-giving is a task of a lifetime. So he will say this. We each, has to, we each of us has to spend a lifetime learning to give ourselves away. And we learn to trust. We learn sacrifice. We learn love. And th these are the way I explain it. You know, when you're a kid, when you're a kid, you're like four years old, and you want to give yourself away. What you do is you draw a crazy Crayola picture and you give it to your mom. And this is me. I get, now your mom looks at this. It's a mess. I don't even know what it looks like, but it is beautiful because it is you. And then as you get older, you get to kindergarten, you want best friends. Now I ask my students, what defines a best friend when you're a kid? Secrets. <laughs> you can tell you, I'm going to make you my best friend when I tell you my secret. And you notice, it is about giving myself away. My secret is an intimate part of me. I give myself away, and I give it to you. Now. And I point out, <laughs> when I was a kid, if I gave you a secret, I expected one back. And there would be a major problem <laughs> if I gave myself to you and you did not reciprocate. See? And as we go through life, we, slur we try to give ourselves away to m more and more of it. And this is, this is the... This um, is what the Pope will say. Sexual intimacy is in, in one way how we respond to that act, the desire to give yourself away when you have told everyone your secret, right? So you meet someone, you start talking, and then you start giving your secrets, but you desire to give even more than that. And so now, he says, you get naked. Because that nakedness is your most intimate secret. Now, it's not about how beautiful you are. Because when we say we're naked, we say we show everything. We reveal everything, including that which is ugly. It's easy to show what is beautiful. It is hard to show what is ugly. And this is what he says. We are naked. We are vulnerable. And this is what happens. When we reveal our brokenness, when we reveal our ugliness, 
We are asking to love and we are asking to be loved. This is the vision. This is the vision of this account of what sex and intimacy is. Now you will see what happens, right? If this is the case, if this is true, then it must be reserved for an exclusive and lifelong relationship. Why is that? Because only in this context will you truly be safe. Only in this context can you really be vulnerable without the risk of rejection. So one of the things, and I didn't have a chance to get into this, is that the Pope highlights how when we are naked, we are highly vulnerable to rejection. Because we want to be loved. We want to love. And so when we are naked and we are rejected, it is profoundly destructive for who we are and our ability to love ourselves, let alone to love another. And this is why the context, you see, I, I am not talking here about law. I'm talking about a vision of why, if this were true, as I believe it to be, that you have to structure your life so that you will find someone truly safe to be naked with for the rest of your life so that you will learn to trust, to surrender, to sacrifice, to love and be loved in that environment. Now you notice my students will spend a lot of time talking about consent. I don't know if you heard, in California last month, there was a law passed where now removing a condom in the middle of the sexual act requires consent. And you can be sued if you quietly remove a condom. And we were talking about it in my classroom the other day. And one of the things that my guys especially said is so frustrating is you don't know when the consent is revoked. Because the, constant, the consent is constant. It has to be present all the time. And so they said, Father, how does the Catholic Church view consent? I said, the Catholic Church sees sexual intimacy as also requiring consent. But the consent is a public consent, and it's a consent that is lifelong. It is not a private one. So that, no, this, the hookup culture favors a private act of consent. Yes, yes, okay, yes. The Catholic culture pre presupposes a public act of consent. There is no confusion. I gave consent in front of the entire world. There are two contrasting accounts of consent. Now, remember this, this is the list, this is the list for sex in the hookup culture. It's fun, hot, me emotionless, meaningless, drunk, physical, temporary, no long-term consequences. This one, I just don't understand that because my students suffer for months. They suffer for a long time and sex is dangerous. And this is the, this is the sex, this is the view of sex. This is my last slide. It is self-gift. It is intimacy. It is beautiful. That made my class pause two weeks ago, one of my students said, Father, I've never thought of sex as beautiful. And it's passionately emotional. It is incredibly emotional. It's about all the emotions. It's about giving, loving, kindness, generosity. It's all of it. It's about attachment. It's about bondedness. And it's meaningful because it is deeply mysterious. It is physical and spiritual. And sex is permanent. Why permanent? To protect the fragile human beings who are learning how to love. It has long-term consequences, both virtuous and vicious, depending upon how. And it is transformative. It will change you for better or for worse. Which one? will you choose? Thank you very much.